Every child depends upon something. When you've got a when you've got a, a youth of fourteen, a fifteen, dependent on you, you've got them by the balls. The dynamics of getting him dependent on you. You've offered him a goal. He weren't smoking. He's just chilling with you. You've offered him a goal. He's been watching you for a few months anyway, blazing. Oh, why not? He's had a joint. He's went white, went a little bit sick. He thinks it's a joke because all you are laughing. Adam, you are laughing at this kid. He's taking a knock off it. You just poisoned him for his first time in his life. And you're laughing at him. So when you have a when you have your thing for the first time and you feel sick and horrible, it's because you've just poisoned your body. When you've put that poison in your body for the first time, it's there. Do you understand? It's there. You've had that taste, you've had that buzz, you've had that head change. Some people refuse to smoke it ever again. Some lads refuse to say, I'm not doing that, that worst episode of my life. Some have the same idea, but because they're still around the people and they're still doing things, eventually he has another go. But the second time round, it doesn't make him sick. He's getting high, he's starting to like it now. There's a problem with this, and this is it. His ma and dad are only throwing him so much money a week. So when he is by, he's got to go arse with his mates. Or he's got to go three of them throw in. And get him, because they're young, not worth them. Still in school. Started smoking, living off the mum and the dad. They can't afford. So they go arse with the mates sometimes. But all this process is giving the kid a dependency. They're giving the kid a dependency. And some of these kids, once the dependency kicks in, they can't go without. And if they haven't got a joint in the morning, they're pulling hair out. They're disrespecting anyone and everyone until they've had a joint and then they're normal. That's how it works with it. But they're dependent now. Dependent. They're not earning money, but they've got an habit. He can't function straight. He's an angry little when he's not got his... The minute you put a joint in him, most mums give up and go, yeah, just go make yourself... Like, that's the best point of call there. Eh? You've got mums up and down the land in Liverpool that are buying children just to stop the anger out there. Once that kid's dependent, and the only source he can get it from is dealer, that's the kid that's made him dependent in the first place. That's the kid that's given his first joint. That's the kid that made him sick. That's the kid that's gonna have a mind's Mars for him in the next month. That kid, He's going to have this kid who's mind in a month, in six months, flying round on the bike that that kid just flew round on for six months. You'll have this kid started his own graft up. While he's starting his own graft up, he's got a few kids round him. One or two of them become independent. One or two of them start depending on him for the play. Because he's given them continuous... I want something in return. Stash that in your ma's house. The first kid for six months is stashing. He's stashing wherever he's stashing, he's stashing. For the kid who started the graft up, who's on the bike now going round seeing the punters. This is how it begins. It's before it escalates. So while he's while this kid's on his bike getting his graft going. He's got this dependent kid who he's given to man the stash. Six months down the line, the phones are ringing. 
everything's a bit better, everything's running smooth. This new kid is half on the ball. He's 14 when he kicked in. When he started minding the stash, he was 14. Now he's 15. He's a bit rehearsed on what's going on. He's been with the boys when they're chopping. He's been over there, he's been there. So he's a bit rehearsed in the game now at 15. Yeah? That kid that's been stashing for six months, and that kid, the boss that was on the bike, the boss now steps off the bike and gets into a car because he's earned enough money to afford one. The kid that was the stash goes onto the bike. And the kid's mate who's also dependent is now the stash. Right? This is how, are you seeing the sequence of events here? You've got the kid that starts the graft. He's on the bike for six months. He's got his phone for six months. He's got his mate who's a stash who he's made dependent on his a youth. And that's the way it works. He's on the bike for six months. The graph's bouncing. The phone's ringing off its cake. He's earning a lot of money. He's bought himself a car. He steps off the bike instead of putting himself at risk on the graft. Where he's got money now. He's got nice cars. He doesn't want to be at risk. He wants to be able to enjoy what he's making. He'll take himself out of risk and put himself in a nice car. He'll still have the graph phone. That's his. The kid that's been in the stash will still have his stash phone. But now his stash phone will be getting used for the punters. So the graph phone is with the boss in his new car. He'll take a phone call off three or four punters. And then he'll pick his other phone up and go, What's happening, kid? Go to A, go to B, go to C. Bang, and it's that all day. So you'll have a boss sat down there, flowing round with his mates, going for scans, answering the graph phone, just getting on with his normal life. You'll have that young kid that was what was the stash, now on the bike, taking the risks, but making no profit for this kid who's in his car, buzzing with himself. That kid's mates who was towing round with him everywhere is now the stash. Do you understand what I'm saying? Six months down the line, the kid that began as the stash and who's now on the graft, six months down the line, he's now answering the phone, sitting in the passenger seat of his boss. The kid that was stashing is now on the bike and now they've got a new kid to be the stash. And it continues. And the longer they get away with it, the bigger the parcels become. And the longer they get away with it, the more stash kids come into play. And they, as I say, they start as a stash, then they get put onto this and then they elevate into that. And 10 or 15 years down the line, if that group is not being touched, what you're looking at is an efficient, dangerous, organized crime group. That's how it starts. And it normally ends with prison and murder. But it begins with a youth being manipulated and groomed with the intention of having him taking risks that he doesn't have to take. That's what it's about. In that whole world, you've got adults preying on people underneath them so they can take the risk and these don't have to. And that's why you've got 60, 65 year old crime lords that still exist today because there's levels and levels and levels underneath them now. It's hard for the police to break through them all and get to the top. The police have never got to the top of crime in this country, even when Curtis Warren was taken down. He weren't top. You know what I mean? He weren't up there. You see all the money that Warren was making in the millions and the millions and the millions you see the way he's on, he entered that blacklist for being at 140 million in the world. That money never went into his back pocket. It's gone into Glennon's. It's gone into the real old school money men. Warren, individuals like, they're just pawns in a massive billion pound enterprise, mate. Fall guys. When Warren's grafting, yeah, they put him down to he was the smuggler, he imported this, he imported that. But the people that put him on a plane and took him over to these people, 
you heard the story, oh, we just got on a plane and went over to Bogota and met this kid out the blue. No, 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 no. Philly Glennon introduced him to the connections that helped the smuggling project. Philly Glennon was the money man for a naughty firm of old school gangsters that Curtis Warren wasn't involved with. Do you understand what I'm saying? And in that layer of crime, policemen, council officials, solicitors, loads of different people involved when it comes to that amount of money. Look at the money all, all the lower levels are making. Look at Sean Tees, 1.5 million in a year. Where's it going? Warren hasn't been in the city for years. Where was it going? They're all the four guys. There is men up there making millions and millions and millions of pounds a year. And they're making houses up and down the land and the government are paying for the houses. So when you look at wimpy homes, when you look at red rope housing, if you go deep, you'll understand what I'm saying. <coughs> but you've got to be willing to go deep and research because it's been going for longer than what you were born. It's been going for years, decades, mates. And that's why it's unbreakable. 